what's your sense of our ability to keep up with the Chinese in AI? We had Kai Fu Lee speaking last last year, and uh, and uh, there's a lot of concern about China. What's your view on on uh, that challenge or opportunity or menace? <laughs> So Kai Fu and I know each other well. He worked for me for a decade. Yeah. And he can be understood as an optimist about Chinese application of AI techniques to business and business and society. And that's sort of his view. And that he wrote a book about it. Yeah. So and I generally agree with him. But let me give you some recent data. So I went to Singapore because I didn't want to go to China and I met with my Chinese friends. And these are Ch men who are Chinese nationalists, you know, the stereotype, short hair, you know, I'm a member of the party, I'm driving and so forth. Yeah. And they're very smart and quite ruthless as business people. So they're impressive people. All they wanted to do is complain to me about President Xi in China. And it, and it turns out something happened six or seven months ago involving when they started, for example, banning Ch uh, English language training and things like that within the country, where the people who are my friends realized that she is not a capitalist. He's a Marxist Leninist. Mm. And like, oh, my God. And so now this category of people who are impossibly valuable and impossibly smart to Chinese as a country. Mm are now seriously trying to figure out how do I get myself and my family out of it. Now, this is not to say that there's not another generation of people right below them, but they'll encounter the same thing. So one way to understand the China problem is first, um, let me say it correctly, in the rest of my lifetime, the tensions between China and her growth and the West and its growth are going to be the defining one. It won't be Russia, as much because Russia is much easier, China is much harder. Second, we're going to be integrated with China, whether we like it or not. We're not going to decouple the boring stuff, which is the majority of it. We're going to buy steel and parts and furniture yeah. and so forth and paint. For certain areas, we're going to have huge fights. And those areas will involve AI, quantum, uh, uh, basically forms of new energy, synthetic biology, certain kinds of transformation, and a couple of other things, including re uh, face recognition and tracking. If you take a look and you score how they're doing versus we are, they are dominant in financial services, uh, surveillance, and new energy, and probably in autonomous cars, and all, certainly in 5G, where we lost that big time. Mm -hmm. the, the U.S. is, at the moment, still leading in these other areas. How do I know what the list is? China published their list <laughs> two years ago. And when I did the AI commission, we actually published our list, which turned out to be very similar to their list. Mm. And the White House recently published another version of the same list. It's all the same things. So we understand where the engagement is. So one way to think about it is that we're not at war with China, but we're in a competition, rivalry, cooperative framework where the stakes are really high. Mm. The scale, for example, of the synthetic biology revolution is trillions of dollars of new wealth. I'd like that wealth to be in the West and in particular in the United States and especially in the Republican red states where a lot of the feedstock is, right? That seems like a good outcome for America. So we need to get ourselves organized to make that happen. So, um, if uh, our response however, isn't so enlightened in my view as your, ex, your, your view and your proposal. Uh, our current response is trying to deprive China of access to critical semiconductor technologies uh, the for, and to have a kind of poultice of subsidies that supposedly will compensate for loss of half of the world's semiconductor market uh, with, and, and uh, pushing 
I gather already semiconductor capital equipment companies in China are already growing five times faster than semiconductor capital equipment companies in the United States. In other words, most of our sort of adversarial efforts to inhibit uh, Chinese progress are in fact both uh, failing to inhibit it, they actually spur Chinese progress, but in directions that do not uh, cooperate or collaborate or, or uh, use U.S. standards and protocols and architectures. They, we're, we're really trying to drive them, to vindicate Xi's Marxist-Leninism. Now, this may be a, a really effective way to <laughs> destroy China, but it's, uh, it, in this process, I fear that it will destroy American technological leadership. It's, do you have any uh, comments on that? Yeah, I don't, I don't completely agree with the way you described it, okay. because um, as long as the restrictions are very specific, and as long as they have a national security purpose, I'm okay with them. So let's consider ASML, which is the sole source manufacturer of the technology required to do ultra EV, which is basically five nanometers yeah, and below. Right. And for the audience's benefit, a smaller number is better. And one nanometer is roughly the size of an atom. So, or basically the space between atoms. So. To give you a sense of how small these things are, it's indescribable how much stuff there is. So let's consider, and you want to use the frame of a race, right? There's a race between the U.S. and China on A, B, C, and D. We lost 5G. I don't think we can, for all sorts of reasons, I don't think we can hold them back on software because software is too diffuse. It leaks. It's too easy for them to steal it and so forth. The Trump administration, followed by the Biden administration, targeted semiconductors because they're so important to both national security and economic growth. And so China's response, which is called dual circulation and made in China 2025, is to put more and more money into companies like SMIC, S-M-I-C, which is the one that does their own chips. Yeah. Now, they already build the majority of the world's packaging. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the logic. And so somebody discovered about two months ago that China had stolen from TSMC, which is a Taiwanese company, the recipe for a five nanometer chip. And subsequent to that, SMIC announced it was doing five, sorry, seven nanometers. It announced it was doing five nanometers in the process that's available to them. We have announced on the West that we're going to go from five to four to two. Now, is the difference in two nanometers versus five nanometers a big difference? In most cases, it's not, but it's, it's, it's a serious difference, but it's not a, a, a disabling difference. So that shows you that even with all of the sanctions and the restrictions, it's very hard to hold the, the Chinese back because they're so good at what they do. It's a different model. I don't, I'm not endorsing it. I don't want to work there. I think it's a bad place in all sorts of ways. But the fact of the matter is we need to take them seriously. It's a different but effective system. And we need to be aware of it. I'm not as worried about other countries because their systems are not as, is not a, not as effective. Well, if we um, mimic them, uh, you know, they've been mimicking us. So even with their supposed Marxist-Leninist she, I agree that he's... Uh, bad news, uh, but uh, even with that, they have um, more venture capital being dispersed. They got uh, many more engineers, um, millions more engineers. They got, uh, they're, they're really in a strong position because they mimicked us, because they uh, have an extraordinarily intensely competitive entrepreneurial economy. They, while actually, in 
practice today, their government spending, such as it is, and it's hard to define it, but but the estimates are that it's maybe half as much government spending as a proportion of their GDP as we have. Mm -hmm. So I'm worried that, that we have this idea that we're faced with this conventional Marxist-Leninist adversary, and, uh, and we mimic him by having uh, big chip, new chip acts and essentially um, uh, kind of having uh, the administrative state take over our technology, and that's what I've, I worry, worry about. Well, the, the good news, the good news for us about China is China has other problems. It appears as they hit peak population, their demographics are terrible. Their growth rate is down to somewhere between one and two percent, depending on whom you believe, which is not enough to keep things going well. So I think China is going to have trouble politically and have trouble in terms of economic growth. And the way they're going to solve that is by doubling down on technology as it makes them more productive. Yeah. So the reason I'm focused on China is that my argument is true whether they're doing great or doing poorly. They're smart enough and they have enough money and enough people and enough talent and enough PhDs to do this. The solution for the United States is to take that, that model, that innovation model I described, the government yep. and universities and private capital and double down on it, make it bigger, and also work with like-minded partners. Yeah. Think about Japan, think about Australia, think about India, think about some of the larger European countries. Yeah. The little countries don't matter because you need lots of people to pull these things off, but the big ones can be strong allies for us in terms of the Western growth. Mm -hmm.